Hello, John. Hello, John. So today we're going to have a podcast regarding the Phoenicians. Paul, how are you, sir? Hello, Zach. How are you? Uh, good, good. What's happening, my friend? <laughs> I think Rolf is going to do the whole presentation today. We're just uh, out there to uh, kind of like, you know, support him and stuff. I'm trying to break, bring up his um, just in case. Um, his presentation, um, just in case if he won't be able to. John is still connecting. How's your weekend so far? Pretty good. How about yours? Good, good, good. Uh, you guys ready for Pericles, Plutarch on Wednesday? Yeah, I, I read it. Nice. Really interesting. Did you read it? Yes, I did. And, you know, I just gave it to my other two buddies. So we might have addition. We're almost 17 people. So we're going to have a discussion. Uh, pretty good discussion, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was really extraordinary. And um, I mean, one, you know, kind of a minor thing, but you know, the uh, his famous funeral oration, Pericles mm -hmm. famous funeral oration, right. everybody reads it in, in college. Right. I always thought it was about the Peloponnesian War, but it, it's not. It's right. about the Samian War. Correct. That is correct. Samian War was, to remind me, that was the between what? Athens uh, and Samoa. Sam and uh, Samoa, yeah. Hi there, hey. John. Oh, hi. Hi, guys. Ooh. Just commenting on how much I enjoyed reading Pericles. Ah. I have yet to do it. I dug out the uh, my John Dryden translation, which I've had for many years, but I so long i never got around to it i listened to actually i i listened to it there are these uh, uh ex libris recordings huh. which are all in the public domain oh, on really? youtube uh I will make and uh so i listened to it you know like largely when i was driving huh. it's a really nice way to double task ex libris yeah if you just yeah ex libris i think it's called uh, if you if you just go into YouTube and in their search engine you type in Plutarch Pericles it'll take you there. Okay. I also uh, I've been reading Xenophon, which I'm going to be presenting on the same way. And nobody's reading Jewish Wars. What's going on here? <laughs> I know you don't like it, but you know. Hey, well, hey throw me, I know. give me a break. <laughs> I've read a lot of throw me, Josephus. throw me, throw me a bone. <laughs> I've, I've read a lot about Josephus. There's been two or three books about him in the last few years, but I can't say I've ever read a book by Josephus. <laughs> yeah, he is, he is a uh, fascinating hero, Jewish general, then turned traitor, ended up in the Vespasian's uh, entourage in Rome. Yeah, yeah, he was a, he was a priest. Yeah, he was a uh, rabbi, rabbi. No, he was a priest. <laughs> he he priest, I'm sorry. Right. They didn't just, have a rabbi at the time, right? He was a priest in the can, temple. They didn't have he, a rabbi at the time, right? If you think of it. I mean, they had, well, well, they had priests. They actually didn't, I don't think, know if they called them rabbis yet. I guess they did. Rabbi is a teacher, as far as yeah. I know. Right, right. So, I don't I mean, think Jesus was referred to as rabbi, I guess. I see. Hi, Rolf. Hello, how are you doing? Good. Uh, so, let me just... Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, make sure that you can Hello. share. Um, okay, you can share. Go ahead. Okay. Do you see it? Yep. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> So, Rolf, I mean, you know, you're um, you're basically, you know, um, if you need to take the whole time, take the whole time. I only have a couple references, and Greg is the same way. 
So, you know, as much time as you need, it's all yours. The floor is yours. Okay. What are, what are you speaking about? No, I'm just going to have references to the uh, child sacrifice, which is always fun. And, um, and then you have uh, uh, Phoenician, you know, prostituting their uh, virgins. Okay. Uh, well, if it's okay with you, I'd, I'd prefer actually to have you mixed in with mine rather than me doing a long one and then you doing some brief short ones. So when we get to religion, um, I'll invite you <clears throat> to do something. I have Greg's, um, I have some images from Greg, so I think I'll do the same thing with him. Sure, sure. I'm, yeah. I'm here, by the way. Yeah, yeah of my, course. Well, yeah. well, yeah, wherever you want, uh, I could. Uh, yeah, yeah let, let's you. let's let's sure. just blend. Let's just mix them together. So I'll. All right. Um, <clears throat> OK, actually, yeah, I was thinking of mentioning the child sacrifice, but then I, I, I didn't do it. So that will. But when we get to that, you would have probably a better job. I mean, I literally, you know, looked it up last minute. And I, you know, yeah. I apologize. OK, no, I would have just put in a reference because I, I don't know anything about it other than the fact that they say it occurred. Yeah, I'll have like a short two minute uh, clip while I'm going to be talking. It's going to be showing, um, and I, I have to pronounce it correctly. Um, hold on, so what's, what is it called? It's it starts with a T, torrent of, um, so yeah, it's, it's called torrent in, um, in Carthage. That's where the children were, or the remainders were buried. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, I will fill the blanks, maybe some, you know. But uh, you know what I was uh, preparing is a little bit about Tyre, uh, because it's uh, before, uh, because that's where the Carthage uh, comes from, uh, and then about Carthage, but uh, you know, only uh, early you know, the foundation myth and, and a little bit of uh, historicity uh, about that early yeah. period. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, and then remember, you know, people are gonna ask questions and all that stuff. So sure. you, might, you, might, you, know, you might fill in those times as well. How's everybody doing so far? Mikhail is here, Michael is here. Um, you know, guys don't forget on November 1st, we're doing, you know, English Revolution. Uh, which is I've added last minute, so um, so just you know whoever registered, awesome. Whoever didn't register, and Michael is going to present there. So Next, that's, that's uh, on Saturday. That's going to be um, on Sunday at three. Huh. So what's next week? Next week um, at Wednesday we have Plutarch, right, uh, and then. Um, and then Sunday we have a special treat. Vlad is going to present Kosovo. Ah, on, Sunday of, uh, Kosovo. Yeah, um, he, he is Serbian, so he, he must have. He's to he's say not that. just Serbian; he's a Serbian from Kosovo. So right. it's an interesting. It's going to be an interesting aspect. And Ralph and um, you know and and you know what's his name? Greg knows knows him you know from our history. You probably met him, you know, you didn't meet him, uh, you know, Paul, but he's, but you, you, you saw him on one of the presentation, I think he did on. Yeah, already, he, he, he made a presentation already in this club. Yeah, but I don't know if Paul was here. Uh, I don't what remember. Was, what was the subject? The subject was on the World War One and uh, the killing of the, uh, uh, the Ar uh, Archduke. Uh, Archduke, yeah. Yeah. And then in Sarajevo, was... yeah, that's also his. <laughs> Right, yeah, oh, it's disturbing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's funny, you know, my, my the super in my building, and uh, they have a network in in the neighborhood are all uh, Albanian Kosovars. Mm. And uh, yeah, yeah, but they but the uh, Albanians uh, they differ uh, from let's say Bosnians. They they both Muslims, but the Albanians mm -hmm. are of the old. Uh, stock, uh, Illyrian stock, while Bosnians are uh, Slavs. So they, oh, they what? actually, Bosnians Slav, Slav Slavic uh, they origin. They were Bosnian Slavs Slavic that were converted who, who by converted the, to, uh, to by Islam. the Turks. Uh, on the Turks, yeah. And, and, and the um, Albanians are the Illyrians who were original there before Slavic invasion, like the Slavs came there mm. like around 6th century. AD, but prior 
right? So that, you know, a lot of them, uh, Diocletian was of that, uh, of uh, you uh -huh. could say, of that stock, uh, and, and many, many other emperors uh, later in the later Roman Empire were. Yeah, he, was uh, were the, uh, uh, uh? he was the only emperor to retire, and he retired back to a, right, his palace right. and split. <laughs> Yeah, it, which is in the, yeah, Croatia. And then uh, everybody but, came to him to ask his advice and he told them to fuck off. Right, <laughs> right. So, but that was before, that was before the Slavic uh, uh, migration, uh, which yeah, was I'll, kind I'll, of I'll, more I'll, of a migration rather than conquest, kind of like very slow. Uh, so, so they're ethnically very different. And even they, they're both uh, Muslims, Albanians and Bosnians, hmm. but they're ethnically completely different, different languages, everything. So they don't really get along with each other. <laughs> yeah, Albanian is not a Slavic language. It's unique within Indo-European. There are no close relatives. My understanding is that the Albanians were among the most aggressive in refusing to cooperate with the uh, final solution and protecting hmm. Albanian Jews. Hmm. That, they, that basically no Jews were exported from Albania because the Albanians wouldn't permit it. That's absolutely correct. Yes, that that was uh, that's a correct statement. Um, Primarily because they were seen saw them as fellow Albanians. Correct. I mean, even Mussolini was much you know lenient toward you know he wasn't exporting Jews. He was just saying they're Italian citizens. Bulgaria, Bulgaria and Tsar didn't allow any uh, exportation of Jews. Right. And I think in Denmark, right, the, the king came out with the Jewish star on the streets, marching, saying that we're all Jews, basically. Yes. But, uh, you know, it was a lot, lot easier for the Germans to do what they wanted in Denmark than in Albania. Correct. Yeah, well, obviously. Um, as sad as it sounds. Um, so we'll give it a couple more minutes. Uh, Ralph, I apologize. It's just people arriving um, slow today. Um, Jane, how are you? Natasha, how are you? Hi. Uh, Beverly, how are you? Hi. Olga, how are you? Um, thanks for joining today. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna quickly start. Um, so today, the, the subject matter is the Phoenicians. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, the uh, Phoenicians, you know, in general, um, and Phoenician and seafarers. And then we'll have, a, a, you know, you know, a reference to Carthage, which was their um, colony. And without further ado, Ralph, why don't you start? OK. Um... So this is a current uh, satellite image of the area of Lebanon. And Phoenicia is basically the same as Lebanon today, the same area. Um, so in red are some of the major cities of Phoenicia. Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos are probably the three most important. Uh, there were a couple of other city-states where Tripoli is now. They weren't, it wasn't called Tripoli. I guess at the time, it was called B Sidon, Tyre, and Byblos. Tripoli, there were a couple of other city-states in that area with different names. And I stuck in Beirut. Beirut wasn't a, a name at the time. I'm not sure whether, I think there may have been a city-state in the area. There were a bunch of city-states, but... Um, Biblo, Sidon, and Tyre were the three main ones. There was the site of Baalbek uh, in the interior um, toward the northern part of the Beka Valley. And then uh, I guess according to the references, Phoenicia may be considered part of the land of Canaan, which goes down to the Sinai Peninsula and down to the Egyptian border. <clears throat> um, or I guess sometimes Phoenicia may be seen as the neighbor of Canaan. Um, uh, what the image, the image shows, if, if you can read it, there is a narrow coastal plain in uh, Phoenicia or Lebanon. Uh, that's the lighter area along the, 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 that thin light strip along the coast. And then there's a darker uh, 
a darker area, darker, a wider, darker strip inland of that, which are the mountains, the hills of, of Lebanon. Um, there's a, the climate is uh, cool and humid in the winter and hot and dry in the summer. In the winter, there are uh, winds coming off the Mediterranean. They provide some rain along the coastal area, but they drop most of their rain on the hills, the mountains, as they go inland and as they go up. Uh, they release their rains as they do on the west coast of the U.S., for example, uh, and then having <clears throat> dropped all, having lost all their humidity <clears throat> going up those mountains, when they go down the other side, they dry out, and you get what's called a rain shadow on the eastern side of those Lebanese uh, mountains. Um, so you get basically, you, once you get inside, it's, uh, there's an awful lot of desert. Um, now on the immediate side, for example, in the Bekaa Valley, there's plenty of water because there are rivers coming down out of the mountains. Uh, and that gives water for irrigation, uh, similar to Mesopotamia and to Egypt. Um, but in particular, of course, on those mountains of Lebanon, there are the famous cedar forests, the cedars of Lebanon. And uh, on the right hand side, you've got the flag of Lebanon with the le famous Lebanese cedars, a Lebanese cedar in the middle of it. Uh, most of those cedars are now gone. They have been stripped and they've been replaced by pine and fir and other uh, faster growing smaller trees. But um, the, because the cedars of Lebanon were <clears throat> very important and that was one of the major trade goods. Um, but L Phoenicia was divided up into independent city-states, uh, presumably because there just wasn't a lot of open land. There were, there were hills just to the east um, and so cities set up on the coast, on the coastal strip. Um, it was sort of, it wasn't that easy to conquer everything. So they were semi, they were independent or semi-independent for a long time, unlike the broad uh, Tigris and Euphrates Valley in Mesopotamia or the Nile in Egypt, where there was one long strip of water, pretty flat, and it was fairly easy to build, a, to conquer all that or to dominate all that and to build uh, an empire. Um, whereas Phoenicia always remained, in many cases it was a tributary state, but it was never really integrated into uh, any of the other empires. Uh, okay, um, I stuck in Ugarit at the very top. Ugarit was not part of Phoenicia, although it was, it was a trading post. Uh, <clears throat> and also spoke, spoke a related language, um, but it wasn't really part of Phoenicia. Uh, and then there are a couple of other trading, inland trading cities, uh, north and east of Ugarit was Ebla, and uh, in from, I think in from Beirut and perhaps on the extreme right of this map was Mari. So those were two trading posts between uh, Mesopotamia and the coast, because Mesopotamia relied on the coast uh, for certain supplies. Okay, here. Could I, could yes. I just? Uh, I saw that there was a question, and I wanted to answer from Hadrian. Yes. Whether they they were the sea people? No, they were not the sea people. As a matter of fact, uh, they did the genetic studies, and they found that uh, uh, the contemporary people of Lebanon are very closely related the stock from the Canaan. So they're actually the same people as the Canaanites. Uh, so they actually benefited from the Bronze Age collapse uh, because the sea people uh, weakened Egypt and, and practically destroyed Hittite empire. And that actually uh, allowed them to blossom. So yeah, that's they, entirely they original. correct. Huh? The, Egypt, the Egyptians were forced to, they had control that area but they were forced to withdraw when the sea peoples, whoever they were, 
yeah, that's uh, what took I, over uh, Egypt, the weakened, essentially. They weakened uh, Egypt, uh, that's, uh, and, and they uh, almost destroyed Hattai. Uh, Ralph, are you, are you going to speak to who the Phoenicians were in ethnic terms? Uh, well, I don't have much on their origin. I guess the cities, as, as indicated here, go back to, oh, maybe 4,000. Sidon seems to be the first to appear, and then Tyre, Byblos, Baalbek. Uh, they were a Semitic-speaking group, I guess West Semitic, so related to the Canaanites uh, and others. But do, do you have any thoughts on where they came from? Yeah, I mean, well, my, my understanding is basically that the, the well, first of all, obviously, Phoenician is a Greek name. Right. Uh, it's, so they never called themselves Phoenicians. Um, and uh, ethnically, my understanding is essentially that that whole section, including the Judeans and the Israelites, were all essentially a single ethnicity. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's I a really it. critical I, point. I there, were genetic, that. there were genetic studies that and that's a that. really critical point from the point of view of modern historiography because it's so beaten into our history that the, the Jews were different from the Canaanites. So the fact that they were actually not different from the Canaanites is a really critical piece of information for understanding the history, understanding the Bible, and things like that. Okay, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think that's good, good background. So they were all, I guess they were part of the West Semitic branch of the Semitic language family. So they were all speaking uh, at least related dialects, related, closely related languages or related dialects. Yeah, the, uh, Phoenician is amazingly close to Hebrew. We, we don't know much about the vowels because the script was really almost completely consonantal, but in terms of all the sound changes and phenomena you see in Hebrew, Phoenician is a close match. I mean, it, 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 they were not mu mutually comprehensible though, but they were close. And there were four other languages and the, they, they're all in the Canaanite family. It's Hebrew, Phoenician, throughout, throughout Edomite. The Bible, what? Throughout the Bible, you, there's this, you know, there's this campaign against the worship of Baal. Yeah, well, the Jews had the monotheistic Revolution. Well, I don't know that they really did. Unclear. I don't think the Jews really were. I don't think they were Jews, and I don't think they were monotheistic yeah. oh, in, prior in, to the Babylonian exile. But I, I do. But I think it's clear that 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 they were ethnically identical with the people who later became known as the Phoenicians, and many of them worshipped the same gods. They worshipped Baal, though Baal was localized, like the Greek gods. You'd have Zeus of Dodona, Zeus of this. Mm -hmm. Right, so you had Baal in many different places, but it was still Baal. And yep. you know the constant, the constant warfare essentially between, uh, as the Bible presents it, between the partisans of, of uh, Baal and the true God Yud Hey Vav Hey, if to give him his proper name. Okay, yeah. Um, I sent out last night uh, some of the ancient texts, including some of the texts from the Bible showing some of, uh, some of the comments, but uh, some of the references to Lebanon versus, um, uh, versus Phoenicia, uh, Phoenicia, or Lebanon, Phoenicia versus uh, the Israelites. Um, and I'll be getting into both religion and language uh, a bit later. Um, in any case, so, as you say, they never referred to themselves as Phoenician. In fact, I'm not sure they ever referred to themselves collectively. They referred to themselves as people from Tyre, from Byblos, from Baalbek. They identified with their city state. Um, but as, I guess, Mesopotamia increased in power and Egypt um, and a threat to the independence of these city states grew, they formed an alliance, a military alliance, but always an alliance between equal independent city states. They never identified themselves as a state, uh, much less an empire. And they, they weren't, they were never aggressive. They, they just wanted to do their trade, be left alone, be able to trade. Uh, they never attempted to conquer anybody. They attempted to defend themselves, but of course they weren't all that successful or they were semi-successful. They could always fight back, but they never, they never took the fight to either Egypt in the south or uh, Mesopotamia in the east. 
Now, as Greg, uh, I guess it was Greg mentioned, they were largely spared in the Bronze Age collapse. Um, and I'm not, I guess nobody really knows the difference, but Ugarit just to the north was completely destroyed. The Hittite Empire was destroyed. Um, the Philistines settled further south along the coast, apparently at the time of the Bronze Age collapse. Uh, Egypt was attacked, of course, and survived, but uh, was, was damaged. But Phoenicia was apparently untouched. Um, the reduction in trade throughout the Eastern Mediterranean presumably hit the Phoenicians, but they were able to rebuild. It, it hurt everybody else much more than it hurt them. So they were able to, they gained certainly in relative power, and I guess ultimately in uh, in absolute power. So they became the trading and the seafaring uh, uh, people of the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly uh, to some extent before, but then even more after the Bronze Age collapse around 1200 and in the subsequent decades. But nonetheless, uh, around 883, they became a tributary of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire conquered them and they became a, a vassal state or tributary state, um, not never integrated into any of the empires, but remaining certain independence, but subject to them. Uh, in 814, they started colonizing or around that time, but in 814 BC, Carthage was established. And at that point they were setting up colonies all around the Mediterranean to support their trading networks. Uh, in 605, the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians and they came under the uh, uh, domination of the Babylonian empire for uh, 70, uh, what, 60 some years. And then the Persian empire under Cyrus, he conquered everything and they became tributary or vassal states of the Persian empire, sometimes becoming, sometimes sort of refusing to pay tribute, I guess, and sometimes paying tribute. So some certain amount of conflict, but basically uh, most of the time dominated by the Mesopotamian empires. In 480, as we saw last week, um, the Phoenicians were the biggest contingent in the Persian fleet at the Battle of Salamis. Now that was very, that was part of the Persian fleet, um, but the Phoenicians provided a large numbers of boats and rowers uh, for the triremes of the uh, Persian fleet at Salamis. Uh, around 450, they established the colony at Tingis, which is now Tangier. So they were all the way at the extreme west of the Mediterranean at that point. So they had trade networks throughout the entire Mediterranean and they were, uh, I guess at that point, they were still kind of the dominant seafaring Mediterranean, well, sea power and trading power. Ralph, do you have yes. the approximate date of uh, the establishment of Cadiz, Goddess? Uh, that's, I guess that... Because um, that's even, that's actually on the Atlantic Ocean. That's right. Well, I guess it was around this same period that they were going out through the Straits of Gibraltar and going both up and down of the Atlantic coast. Um, now, I don't have any particular dates for that, that colony. Meanwhile, back in Phoenicia proper, uh, Sidon got into a fight and was destroyed by Artaxerxes III in 350. Alexander of Macedon destroyed Tyre. Uh, these places pushed back, I guess they were uh, Artaxerxes and then Alexander attempted to dominate them. They pushed back and rather than just being conquered and reduced again to vassal states, Sidon and Tyre were uh, completely destroyed. At which point, in fact, even before that, uh, Carthage became the center of the Phoenician trading network. Uh, Carthage was a Phoenician city and Carthage became more larger, more important, more powerful than any of the uh, Phoenician states in Phoenicia proper. Um, then you had, then they became, came under the Seleucid Empire in 312. 
uh, and then the Roman Empire. Phoenicia became part of the Roman Empire around 64. And at that point, uh, so uh, by 350, I suppose, Phoenicia didn't really exist as such. It was, at that point, it was really integrated into the uh, empires. Okay, this is a map of the Mediterranean. Uh, it doesn't give dates, but it shows Cadiz or Gadir. They're just outside in, on the Atlantic coast, outside of the Strait of Gibraltar. Uh, and I guess it's fairly widely believed that at some point they actually made it all the way up to Britain, um, particularly for the very valuable tin deposits in Cornwall. Um, although I don't, I don't know if there's actually any uh, archaeological evidence of, uh, of, Phoenici of Phoenicians, I suppose Carthaginians perhaps in particular, in Britain. But uh, they certainly did, were doing a lot of trading in tin. Um, and I guess there may be some textual references that can be interpreted as going all the way to Britain. But yeah, I think that's the, still, a, yes, John. It, it's the reach. Some people claim they made it to Ireland too, and there's no archaeological evidence, but they do share a, one linguistic feature is Phoenician, like a good Semitic language is verb initial, the verb goes at the beginning, and Irish is too, which is very rare in uh, Indo-European, actually. Uh, but oh, okay, it's although- a very I, weak I, argument. <laughs> yes, because Irish obviously is a Celtic, arg, a Celtic yes. language, which is Indo-European, so it's, there's, you the, they're very you, different language families, but they can, but language oh, families can borrow. Very and different languages can inf influence each other each other, yeah. each other, other. It's just the social, you know, you have a few dozen sailors from Phoenicia influencing the Irish language. I mean, it doesn't make sense. I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so, and this shows some of the major trading things. Gold, Egypt was from the major source of gold and Egypt exported gold or gave gold gifts in return for other gifts. Uh, grain from what's now uh, Libya. Uh, there was some tin in Asia Minor, copper from Cyprus, gold from uh, Asia Minor. Uh, they went up through the Black Sea, iron and grain were up there, oil and wine from Greece, copper, timber from Italy, and up into um, north, the, the, Alpine, the Alp area. Um, Tin from around Marseille in France, silver and silver, iron. There were important metal deposits in Spain that were part of this trade network. Now, at the bottom center, you see the location of Carthage, and Carthage was in a strategic location because it was right at the Narrows, uh, where Sicily comes pretty close to the North African coast. So that's a bit of a funnel for trade and shipping. And if you can control that uh, relatively narrow part of the Mediterranean between Carthage and Sicily, you can control a lot. So uh, Carthage was always Phoenician, but si Sicily was a major battleground for control of the Mediterranean sea routes. And I'll get uh, into that a bit later. And that's particularly with respect to Carthage more than uh, Phoenicia proper. Uh, okay. Okay, one of the major exports, the famous, what well, perhaps the most famous export from Phoenicia was Tyrian purple, the famous purple dye. Um, very valuable, very rare, uh, well, hard, hard to process, very difficult to obtain or purify. Um, and a very, very valuable thing was a major export from Phoenicia, particularly from Tyre. And it's the mucus secretion of the sea snails or better known as the murex historically, although that's not their current biological name. And there are a number of different uh, varieties of this. I had always thought snails look like snails, but these are, they don't look like snails, they look more like whelks. Uh, in fact, I suppose whelk is part of the same family. And there are a variety of different 
slightly different chemical forms, slightly different dyes. And the three of the main colors are there on the left, dyed fabrics. Apparently the top one was the most valuable, that reddish purple. A more bluish purple was also very valuable. Uh, the red a little bit less so, but still, still desirable. Um, and it took 10,000 of these shells to yield 1.2 grams of dye. Um, and that 10,000 snails for one, a little over one gram of dye was enough for the trim on one piece, the trim on one piece of cloth. So this was an extremely expensive commodity, but of course for trade, this idea of a very small amount of very valuable thing was an ideal for trade. Easy to transport, not perishable. Um, uh, so a very valuable trading, ex very valuable export from Tyre in particular and Phoenicia in general. One of the remarkable features of Tyrian purple is of this particular organic chemical is the color intensifies with age and exposure. It doesn't fade on the contrary, as it's exposed to worn and exposed to sunlight, the color gets deeper and richer. Um, I guess there seems to be, a, it was discovered in Tyre around 1500 BC, although there were reports of other uh, people, of archeologists having found uh, mounds of sea of these seashells in other parts in around the area of Italy or, and, and other areas. But nonetheless, it was known as Tyrian purple because the Tyrians uh, really developed it as a trading commodity. Um, ultimately, of course, you probably heard it became the Roman symbol of power. Uh, and then the Byzantine symbol of power. Uh, and there were laws restricting the use of this purple dye and purple garments to the most powerful, ultimately, uh, first of all, only to the elite and ultimately strictly to the uh, Roman emperor. And they speak of being the emperor or the uh, heir apparent to the emperor, the son of the uh, Roman emperor being born to the purple. Uh, so, and that was because they had, the picture on the lower right is Empress Theodora, uh, 530 CE, the Byzantine from Constantinople, the Byzantine Empress, uh, and that's a purple gown. I mean, the, I guess the, that's, I guess that's a deep purple. I, I don't know how faithful that color is to the original, but it's uh, certainly being portrayed as a very rich uh, fabric there. In fact, it's a remarkable rendition of a rich fabric done in um, mosaic. In the in the Roman Republic, prior to the empire, uh, the uh, it was very tightly regulated about uh, who could have a stripe, a purple mm -hmm. stripe on their toga, which were senators, uh, and the dictator, which was a constitutional office, had a complete purple cloak. He was the only individual in, in the Roman Republic that was permitted to have that. He was not a regular occurrence. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I guess the extraction of the dye was a fairly complex, unknown process of cooking, adding some other, adding salt and perhaps other chemicals, and then extracting and filtering a bit of uh, separation. Um, so a fairly complex process. And apparently that process is still not entirely known. There are some rough descriptions of it, but I think people have tried to reproduce it without fully success. But the skill of extracting the dye seems to have been lost. Well, it, it started disappearing fairly early on, but by, the, by 1200 CE, particularly in the Byzantine Empire, it seems to have particularly disappeared. So it no longer exists. Now, whether that's just because it's too expensive to extract and there are other things that, uh, that those colors can be achieved by other dyes. Um, as far as I know, I guess those seashells still exist. So I'm not quite sure why it pretty much disappeared ultimately sort of towards the end of the Byzantine empire 
and with the expansion of the uh, what was it, the um, Seleucid Empire, with the expansion of the Mus the caliphates and the conquest of Constantinople seems to have been sort of the death knell for Tyrian purple. Um, so Tyrian purple and the cedar, cedar wood are the two um, sort of iconic exports from uh, Lebanon from from uh, Phoenicia, and they had almost that uh, they were the primary or almost the sole source of that. But I guess as trade, perhaps as traders and as urban coastal people, as uh, with a strong merchant class. I mean, they had kings, but presumably they had a pretty strong middle class or merchant class of traders and artisans and so on. Um, so they became skilled artisans, um, and they're famous. The I, this is an ivory plaque on the left. This is one of the most uh, uh, exemplary of their things, found in Nimrud in um, Assyria, but apparently clearly of uh, Phoenician manufacture. Whether they were made in Phoenicia and then exported to Assyria or whether they were made in Assyria by Phoenician craftsmen is, uh, I guess, not entirely clear. I think there's good evidence that both happened. Uh, on the right-hand side, there's a bronze bowl. And as the decorations on these uh, two indicated, uh, the, the Phoenicians were traders. They were multicultural. They would produce anything for anybody. So these things, there, they used Greek symbols. They used uh, Mesopotamian symbols, Greek symbols, uh, whatever would sell, I suppose. But they were among the most skilled craftsmen. Uh, and again, the texts, uh, the Old Testament texts, the Hebrew Bible texts, um, talk about the King David and King so his successor, King Solomon, around the time of the building of the first temple, they uh, relied on artisans from uh, uh, Biblos. Um, and their texts, I, I put in some text from the no, Old I, Testament. I yes. Biblos or, or, or Tyre, because I know that uh, Hiram the first was the uh, king of Tyre. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you, I'm sorry. You're quite right. It's King Hiram of Tyre is the main primary reference in the Bible. No, you're right. It, it is Tyre, not Biblos. Um, so they would get cedars, but also metalwork, fabrics, dyeing. Uh, and one of the things that appears in the Bible, not the Old Testament. Now, this was uh, from the book of Samuel, book of Kings, book of Chronicles, the history books of the Bible. Now, these weren't written down until the 500s BC, but King David is dated to, um, I think I have the dates there, about 980 uh, BC. So the, the Bible is talking about the period of uh, around 1,000, 900 to 1,000 BC although it was written much later. But according to the Bible, the Canaanites, the Israelites, where they were, of course, they, according to the Bible, they conquered um, the land of Canaan. They were, their main enemies, they were regularly uh, at war with the Philistines to the southwest and the Amalekites and the Edomites and the Moabites. Uh, and the and then later the Assyrians and the Babylonians, but apparently they always got along with the Phoenicians. They never they never had any fights with them. They were friends, and the Old Testament refers to King David being good friends with uh, King Hiram of Tyre and exchanging goods. And uh, in particular, that uh, the Israelites were uh, re re depended on. Um, goods and artisans, craftsmen from Phoenicia. And I, I just wanted... make one comment on uh, the Egyptian yeah. influence. Uh, obviously, yeah. the image on the left has a, a clear Egyptian headdress. Yes. And if you look on the plate on the right, the animals uh, have on their heads, uh, it says the crown of the crowns of, of Upper and Lower Egypt. Quite right. 
Um, the other thing to mention is uh, when I gave my presentation on uh, early Greek art, uh, and I talked about the orientalizing period, this is exactly what we're talking about. These are the, Im the images from Phoenicia that had tremendous influence on, on the development of Greek art. I showed an ivory sphinx, which has many resemblances to the sphinx shown right here. That is a sphinx. Uh, right. And the, the animals shown on the, on the bowl are very similar to the animals that you start to see in geometric Greek pots. Yeah, yeah. so, I, so the, yes. Uh, I, I, I just, I don't know if you, if I'm getting a little ahead, but I also, the cooperation between uh, Israel and, and uh, uh, Phoenicia uh, is also presented in the marriage of uh, Jezebel and King Ahab. I don't know who you're planning to talk about that. No. Okay, so uh, it, it's, uh, it's a little uh, later, like in the ninth century uh, BC. Uh, uh, so Jezebel was uh, the uh, princess from the uh, Tyrian uh, uh, royal family, uh, and uh, King Ahab was the king of Israel. Uh, and uh, of course, in the, in the Bible, the whole story uh, of the struggle between uh, uh, Elia uh, with the Jewish God and, 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 and all Baal uh, that was represented by the uh, Phoenician influence uh, into the Israel at the time. So it's not clearly at that time, a lot of the Israelites uh, uh, were worshiping many gods uh, of Phoenician nature. So it's yep. just another continuation of their uh, close alliance. And uh, they were also allied in standing against the Assyrian invasion. Yep, good, thanks. Um, a couple of other uh, elements. This is uh, a, on the left, the Ahiram sarcophagus from Byblos around 850 BC. Uh, and this is one of the best um, uh, examples of the early uh, Phoenician writing with the Phoenician alphabet. And that bottom yellow strip is uh, from the sarcophagus um, enhanced to show the letters, but that's an inscription there. Uh, so that's uh, an inscription around the sarcophagus and it's a curse. Whoever, I think it's, uh, again, the te I put the text into that uh, sheet, I circulate them. Whoever smashes this uh, sarcophagus, let his head be smashed. It's much longer than that, but it's a curse on anybody who disturbs this. And I guess that's fairly common at the time. Uh, grave robbers were pretty common and so they, uh, people would put a cur would in their bury in their sarcophagus or burial elements they'd put a curse on anybody who uh disturbed the bone their bones i actually read that this is the very first Phoenician uh, inscription uh, ever found i think i guess this may be the oldest one yeah yeah, yeah and th there, there aren't a whole lot of early phoenician alphabetic inscriptions so this one is is yeah fairly one of the longer ones uh, on the right hand side, uh, yes, okay, I guess that I was just, well, I was just struck by the date I had. Uh, these are bronze figurines from Byblos, and I guess Byblos was a bit of a ritual site. Um, the sarcophagus, the king was buried there, these were votive characteristics, the votive figures, and there were huge numbers of them found made in bronze with gold plate. Uh, and there was a collection of them at Byblos serving some sort of ritual or religious function. And this goes way back. This goes back to 1500 BC. Okay. Um, let me now talk about seafaring, and I'll, I'll come back to a, a bit on, on religion a bit later, but let's get into the trading. And so Phoenicia were the major, for much of this period, until the later part when it was challenged, but for much of this period, the Phoenicians were these main traders. Um, Egyptians never did a lot of trading. They did some trading up the coast and some down the Red Sea. Um, but they never did. They were never did much across the Medi uh, around the Mediterranean. Uh, the Greeks came later. 
uh, and then the Romans, but for a long time, the Phoenicians were the main long distance traders. Again, because they were these coastal city states, they didn't have a lot of agricultural land um, and there wasn't much inland of them. So they looked outwards, um, they looked to the sea and outwards for trade. Um, and there were two basic classes of vessels. Um, for trading, the main uh, element was the merchant ship. Now, this is a fairly later one, 200 BC, but that was a that was a trading ship. They were high, uh, fairly rounded. They were uh, their width was two to three times their length. Uh, I'm sorry, the width was half to one third of their length, which was pretty uh, pretty wide. Um, they were by, they were driven by sails. They had a steering oar at the back, but no no rowing oars. They were simply wind driven, um, so they could carry lots of cargo and a small crew. And they didn't have rowers, so they could. And with the wind, um, they could. And with with the wind and without rowers, they could sail all night as long as they were uh, good navigation. And they could navigate by the uh, by the sun, the moon, and the stars, uh, the stars, I guess the pole star at one point was called the Phoenician star because the pole star at least gives you your direction. That's, that's pretty easy. Um, I'm not sure they had the skill to calculate their latitude from the pole star, which you could do, but at least it, you know your direction, you know, which, which at night is is tricky and they could use the stars for that. But the pole star is the easiest way to find your direction at night if you've got a clear night. Um, so they had a lot of these merchant ships uh, that did their trading. Um, now at various times they needed warships on the right to defend their, uh, defend their ships, defend their forts. The merchant ships would almost, whoops, I said merchant ship, uh, misspelling there, merchant ships. Um, so they'd have warships to uh, escort the convoys of trade ships, protect them, uh, fight off the enemies. Um, now this is from, so the, uh, the bireme on the right, uh, the, the oars, this is a road ship, and this one shows no mast, although I think they did have, they usually had a mast and a sail so they could use the wind when it served their purposes to get from one point or to another, but for warfare, oars gave you the speed and the flexibility you needed. Not you couldn't really fight a battle with sails; the wind was too unreliable. So normally they would, uh, as we saw in the Battle of Salamis, they took down the masts and the sails when they needed to fight. The Phoenicians introduced the ram at the front, that pointed ram down around the waterline could uh, enable them to ram and sink enemy ships. You can see the rowers uh, below the deck. Uh, so the, there's a deck above the rowers. Uh, and then you have some soldiers and shields up on the top deck, uh, again, from a sarcophagus. Now, apparently sarcophagus was found in Nineveh, which seems a little odd because that's way inland. Um, so I'm not quite sure it appeared why it appeared there. Um, but anyhow, that would just rough. That would just be because the Phoenicians, for all intents and purposes, were the Assyrian navy in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, maybe there were. I guess often the the sailors themselves, the rowers, were Phoenician, um, but to the extent that they were serving an imperial navy, the officers and the soldiers up top might well be. Uh, Babylonian or, or Assyrian or Persian. Right, but the captains and, and the navigators had to be Phoenicians because they, they were the only ones who knew how to do it. Yes, although the, apparently there's a bit of a distinction in, I think even at the Battle of Salamis, yeah, the helmsman and the navigator, the captain in the sense of the guy who's running the ship has to be Phoenician, but they also had a politically appointed captain in charge, apparently, who was a political appointment from the metropole and a, a probably commissar. knew nothing. <laughs> and probably, and Phoenician, probably Babylonian commissar. Exactly. Probably incompetent. If, if he tried to run the ship, you'd be in severe trouble. But that's right. The running of the ship 
uh, was done by, although the, when you get into battle, I guess you'd have the helmsman managing the ship and then you might have the uh, head of the imperial soldiers on top, the spearsmen and the archers, um, doing the hand-to-hand -hand combat as the ships came alongside or rammed each other. Question, Ralph, yeah. on, before you go. The picture on the left, is that um, in the front, is that a triangular sail on its own mast or is that just you know, the way that uh, an image of the square sail, uh, you know, because that's a critical question for navigation. Yes, indeed. As far as I knew, they only use square sails. Now, oh, I, I guess maybe the whole thing is a square sail. And so this is one edge of the sail. This is perhaps the other edge of the sail sort of curled around. Okay, so, it's so just by a, curling a around perspective view. Yes, but by curling around by not having that by having that square sail loose enough so it could curl around, that gave you somewhat more ability to sail crosswind. So here the wind is coming from the right presumably. Um, yeah, square sails are very good for running downwind. They're terrible. In fact, you, with a square sail, you can't sail into the wind at all. The best you can do is sail across the wind. Um, yeah. The, once yeah, you get the, a... Yeah, Anne. I, I was just going to agree with... I, that's a, you took the words out of my mouth. I mean, with a square sail, it's all about downwind. It's not like modern sail, you know, sailboats like you see out, I see in the Chesapeake Bay with the triangular, which depend on the Bernoulli effect, where the, when you sail into the wind, the wind is literally creating you know an effect that sucks you along into the wind sailing into the wind whereas this is strictly about the wind blowing you um so it's it's a completely different um theory of sailing yeah that's right but actually i'm glad you mentioned that paul i hadn't noticed that before but i think uh by adjusting the square sail and letting it curve around a bit you could get some extra speed going across the wind. Um, this, the brown wooden ship is a modern reconstruction, uh, handmade reconstruction of a uh, Phoenician trading system. It had the iconic horse's head on the bow, fairly broad, fairly deep. So this was a merchant ship, not a fighting ship. Um, but they have gone back and used the drawings and whatever descriptions they have, which are incomplete, and they have reconstructed. And th this ship actually sails around along the Phoenician coast. Um, now, for a warship, they introduced the pentaconter, which became famous for in Greek. And this is a picture of a Greek pentaconter. I couldn't really find a good drawing of a Phoenician pentaconter. Penta comes from 50 oars, 25 oars on each side. So, pent and they also had triaconters, I guess, which were 30 oared. Um, so pentaconter, two, two rolls of 25, about 30 meters long. Uh, you can, on the left, you can sort of make out that ram at the front of the ship, the big square sail. Uh, again, actually, interestingly enough, maybe this was taken from the sarcophagus, but on the left-hand edge of the sail, you see uh, that sail curving around with a line, a rope, running all the way back to the helmsman at the back So, and uh, on the right-hand side. So, those, uh, so the sail wasn't just held down in a uh, square position, but was designed to curl. So in this one, on the right-hand side, it's held down fairly taut. On the left-hand side, it's pulled in to curl around with the wind. Um, actually, I guess so. I guess the wind is coming perhaps from the right rear, I guess, with this sail. And you see the sort of the telltale, what's in effect wind, tell, wind indicators at the back on that. Uh, I guess it's a pole sticking up from the back. Uh, the helmsman seated, uh, helmsman or the captain seated up at the back, the rowers at the bottom. Um, now, normally they'd have a, 
a, a number of soldiers on that top deck. This doesn't show them, and then 50 rowers. But 50 rower, the 50 rowers made up most of the the crew, and they were uh, unlike the the merchant ships were uh, perhaps uh, the width was perhaps one third of the length. On the warships built for speed, they were very long and thin. The width was an eighth, uh, perhaps an eighth of the length. So long and thin, built for speed and maneuverability. And again, as I say, they take down the flag, they take down the sail uh, when they were in the battle. Uh, in, in Homer, it's very clear that the rowers and the warriors were one and the same. Yes, um, actually, that you're, you're quite correct. In the Pentecost, well, certainly in in at the Battle of Troy, according to Homer, yeah, the uh, the soldiers manned the oars. Now they, but of course, at that point, the ships were not fighting ships. The ships were transport ships. So there, yeah, you'd have the the, the in order to maximize the soldier transport capacity, the soldiers would man the oars, and so you get. Uh, hundreds, you get a couple of hundred uh, troops in one ship, which you couldn't do in a, a battleship. Well, so actually, by... in, in, the, in the Iliad, there's this very famous section, which is the catalog of the ships in which they're talking about the contribution of all of the different Greek states. And the, the, the assumption that's made throughout is that one ship equals 50 warriors. Uh, and that's, okay. how, that's how you enumerate the size of the army. Okay, good. I, I, yeah, I hadn't gotten around. To, I, okay, so 50. Oh, they only had 50. Okay, I thought they would have had more than that. So I guess those were fairly smaller ships. Uh, and they may well have been open, uh, open galleys, but they were they were they were rowed. And actually, I guess the introduction of the oar, which I guess maybe was done well before this by the Egyptians was a major innovation. Prior to that, the earliest ships just had paddles. And often you see pictures of st apparently standing paddlers. But the, the invention of the oar and the oar lock um, was an important uh, invention of, of the development of sea, but happened well before the Phoenicians. I think the Phoenicians got that from the Egyptians. Uh, this is a picture of the famous Uluburun shipwreck uh, this was a shipwreck found, uh, uh, well, found recently, but from around 1300 BC. Um, the ship was pretty well uh, disintegrated, but they, could, they knew the size of the ship and it went down pretty well intact. So the car, it was found mostly and is famous mostly for its cargo, um, which, and the cargo was pretty much entirely intact when it was found. So it had a car cargo hold. This is a reconstruction of, of course, a reconstruction of the ship on the left uh, and a cross section on the right. So there was a hold which held, uh, a, which was pretty open, held a lot of cargo, no room for, for rowers. It was all sail driven. Um, and then a top deck for the sails, sailors, the merchants uh, accompanying the cargo. Um, and there's, so there's a good list of the cargo, uh, what's gotten most attention, and I think this is shown in that front compartment, although they're difficult to make out, was the ingots. And it had 10 tons of copper and one ton of tin, which presumably not incidentally was exactly the proportions you need to make optimum bronze, uh, 10 to one copper to tin. And these were um, the oxide ingots. Then there were in the middle section are these um, uh, pots, amphorae, uh, referred to apparently as Canaanite jars. So they were called, Can they were from the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the, I guess the main, the largest uh, group of these apparently contained terebinth resin, which was used as a wine preservative. And so I guess when you talk of resin wine, resina, uh, retsina in, in Greece today, uh, I guess it's this resin from the terebinth plant uh, related to the pistachio, I, I gather. Uh, that's, so this was a major trade item. This was not available everywhere. Some of them contained olives. 
There was one jar of glass beads and glass ingots because the Phoenicians, um, and I don't have anything on this actually, um, but Phoenicians were glass artisans as well. And they made little glass sculptures or statuettes, glass beads. Um, and here, I guess they were exporting glass ingots. So they had made the glass but then exporting it as ingots, where it was, which would be fairly easy for anybody else to melt down and form into other glass objects, bowls or, or decorations of one sort. There was some ebony from coming up from, I guess, sub-Sahara, come from deeper Africa through Egypt. Ivory, likewise, rhinoceros and elephant ivory coming up through Egypt. Amber, there was some amber there coming down from the Baltic gold, silver, jewelry, some metal tools, um, and some nuts and fruit. Um, it is, so it was found uh, off the coast of Turkey, not far offshore, because the ships uh, always tra tended to travel along the shore in case of storms, and so they could lay in and pick up supplies. Although, as I say, the trading ships weren't as limited to, show, to coastal travel as the warships were. The warships were much more fragile and the rowers needed to lay up every night. Um, uh, and so it, what you couldn't tell from the wreck exactly where it had started, where it was bound to, not even the direction it was going, although it was assumed it was headed west. Um, per, well, perhaps, perhaps from Phoenicia, I have said, uh, from Phoenicia to Mycenae in 1300. Um, that's not established. Could have been coming from Cyprus. The, but the it was coming from for, some... The tradition for Mediterranean trade is a, a counterclockwise movement. So heading east along the coast of North Africa, then up the, the coast of the Levant, and then westward along the coast of, of Thrace and Greece and then making the and that has to do with the way that the prevailing winds work and that's essentially basically you were forced to travel in that m way in the ancient world. I think that's right and it was also somewhat seasonal the trade winds are different in the winter and the summer yeah, so well, there's the one winter, season for heading. You didn't, you didn't navigate no. at all. Winter okay. was you know you, you stayed away because you were pretty much guaranteed to have to be shipwrecked. Right. But in addition, I guess there were optimum seasons for heading east and optimum seasons for heading west. So if you were traveling from, I guess, I think in the Bible, Paul talks about heading east to making trips and to that, Jerusalem very, from Asia Minor. And that's very unusual for just that reason. And, you know, this is the Roman era, era where technology is way, way advanced to where it was, you know, basically, uh, you know, 800 years earlier, and they could do things like that. But these, these trading vessels had to stay uh, on that semi that counterclockwise shore hugging route. Yeah. Uh, okay, this boat, um, both models of the boat show the steering oar, I guess, in this case, sometimes they had steering oars on both sides yoked together, as we saw in the Battle of Salamis. In this case, they just had one steering oar. It was a long time, it wasn't until the medieval period that they had uh, the stern post rudder, which was a much more efficient, more powerful, uh, more mechanically efficient way of steering the ship. So they used steering oars uh, to steer the ship in addition to the sail. Uh, but you know, Ralph, they did have a good grasp of Archimedes' buoyancy principles. You know, that goes to the width of the boat um, how much weight they could carry. I mean, they, these, these vessels were well designed from the buoyancy perspective. Yep. Yeah, and so of course, yeah, you want to get all the heavy weight at the bottom. I, I guess sometimes they would even put rocks in the bottom to make sure that it was to improve the stability so that they could have a fair bit of superstructure without it becoming unstable and tipping over in a strong wind. But yeah, they were they were good ship designers, absolutely. And the Phoenicians, uh, Phoenicians leading them, and I guess the the Greeks uh, caught up with them, but but later. Ralph, uh, quick question. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Did they trade during the time of war, or were they trading with opposing side or not, or trading through? I, I think this discovery was from the city of Gorit. Um, 
uh, and that was an important port city, right? So was uh, well, there... it? This, this discovery was off the coast of Turkey. Okay. Not that... from Ugarit. Ugarit, uh -huh. of course, I get, yeah, Ugarit uh, existed at this point, but of course it was wiped out in 1200 and never reemerged. Um, well, I guess there was never really a Mediterranean wide war, but presumably if there was a real battle zone, they'd avoid it. But battles tended to be relatively, sh at least the battles tend to be short. The, the wars could go on, but presumably, yeah, you wouldn't try to send merchant ships through a battle zone. Uh, but in a war zone, yeah, probably depending on who you were trading, what you were trading, I, they could probably work through some of the conflict zones mm -hmm. as long as they didn't get caught up in, in a war. Um, the Battle of Salamis, as I mentioned last time, was the first, I think, entirely sea battle where it was just ships trying to destroy other ships. Um, there was some, sur there they did fight from ship to ship, but prior to that, none of the battles had all been more or less land battles, uh, um, or at least uh, the ships were simply a platform for soldiers to fight in, for example, the Battle of the Nile, uh, which was around 11, 1200 with the, between the Egyptians and the Sea People. That was sort of a sea battle, but it was the, all the fighting was done between soldiers and archers and spearmen on the ships with, arch, with Egyptian archers from the land also joining in. Uh, so, but that's a good question, but presumably, they, yeah, they'd avoid particular danger zones. Um, I guess it was later, once you get into the Greek era and there's real competition, um, then you probably get pirate raids and uh, forces trying to capture the other merchant ships. Mm -hmm. Um, at which point you'd, you'd need a military, a, a trading convoy might need a military escort and might be attacked by an enemy or by pirates. There's, there's a frequent uh, incidents in Homer where characters are basically, their, their life story is that they were kidnapped by Phoenician traders and, and enslaved and then later find their way back into the plot. But that, that was a trope in Homer that Phoenician merchants slash traders slash pirates, they were kind of all the same thing. Right. And uh, I guess a couple more questions. Thank you, uh, Paul. Um, so what was Phoenicians using to build their wealth? Would that, was that dye that they used? That was the trading chip, or so to speak, or a currency? Well, and go ahead. Okay, right. two, uh, two things. Yes, they exported the, the dye and the cedar were their probably primary exports, as well as metal work and glass work. But, and that, that probably got them started and helped them to raise capital, but they probably made more money simply buying being traders. So they traded stuff between Egypt, Asia Minor, Greece, North Africa. Um, so they would just make their money on the trades. They would buy cheap and sell, sell expensive, uh, buy low, sell high. And uh, they probably made more money ultimately from trade than from their own exports. Right. But I think the exports. Remember were... that th that's the link between the great empires of Mesopotamia and the rest of the world. It would all go through that coast of the Levant in both directions. So the Phoenicians were enriched by that. Yeah, from the first, that's right. They had their trading uh, cities of Mari and Ebla in between Mesopotamia proper, or the center of Mesopotamia, and the Mediterranean right. so, coast. And these became big, rich cities purely on the basis of trade. They had no exports, no natural resources of their own. They simply made a lot of money off of trade. Right, but those were not Phoenician cities, those were. No. Marino. That's right. They were Mesopotamia. They were cities they, they on were the actually edge. West, they were West Semitic, but they were not Canaanites. Right. Um, but they, they then traded with the Phoenicians and they made a lot of money and then the Phoenicians would take their, so everybody would make lots of money off the trade. Right. Yep. And the Phoenicians were the last link to get to the wider world. That's right. And then the Phoenicians would carry it throughout the Mediterranean. Do you, uh, do you think I could uh, take over? For a yes, ab ab absolutely. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, because uh, I'm going to talk about but uh, I'd like to go a little bit back. If you could go to first uh, uh, 
first of my uh, slides. You remember that map, a little map, a little further? Yeah, right here. So just a little bit back, very briefly, you know, this is the ancient uh, Phoenicia and uh, these are all of the uh, cities at that time. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the city of Tyre uh, because it's a mother city for the Carthage. Uh, so Herodotus visited Tyre around 450 BCE uh, and uh, he wrote that the priests, because he talked to uh, a, lo a lot of people and the priests, of course, getting the records there. So the priests um, uh, were saying that the city was founded, according to our calendar, approximately 2750 BCE, which is, you can imagine uh, how far that is. And uh, uh, it's still, uh, 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 and then archeological evidence uh, and it was founded as a walled city at that time, 2750 BCE. And uh, the archeological evidence corroborated this timing, by the way, uh, uh, contemporary archeological evidence. Uh, now, uh, also the uh, Greek historian, uh, Eusebius uh, uh, of Caesarea, uh, who was the Bishop of Caesarea, obviously that was like a, in the end of third century, beginning of the fourth century, but he was also a historian uh, uh, and he basically recall, recorded the common myth about the foundation of, of um, uh, Tyre. And it goes that um, the major deity uh, of uh, uh, Tyre is the deity called Melkart, who was a son of uh, God Baal. And uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about him later. So, and uh, he actually built the city, uh, and that's obviously a myth, uh, uh, as a favor to the mermaid Tyros, and he named the city after her. That's how the, the city got um, uh, that name. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Because this is the, uh, uh, no, next one. Uh, yeah, this one. So this is the uh, bust of uh, Melkart. You could see, uh, uh, how mischievous this god is, uh, you know. Uh, so Melkart, uh, uh, as I said, was the son of Baal. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, Baal was a ruler of the universe. Uh, uh, Melkart was king of underworld and also protector of the universe. Uh, Greg? So, yes? Greg, I've, I've often heard Melkart referred to as the uh, the equivalent of Hercules. And you see that he's got a, a lion's head headdress. Right. Which is right. the symbol of which is, you know, the trademark of Hercules. Yes, that 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 too. But, uh, you know, that came out later, uh, you know, as the Greeks, uh, as, you know, Greek mythology started to prevail. Well, this is uh, earlier uh, one. Uh, can you go to the previous one? Uh, to the, yeah, okay. So uh, this is the Amarna letters, uh, 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 you know, 1315. It's an Akkadian uniform, uh, uniform. There was common uh, language, uh, 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 diplomatic language at the time, you know, but this, uh, there were 10 letters and this is one of them. Uh, and this is the letter between a prince of uh, Tyre, uh, Abimilku and uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten. Uh, it was written to Akhenaten where he writes about uh, uh, water, wood, and also Kabiru tribes that overtaking uh, the countryside. Uh, so, you, you know, Tyre is uh, down south uh, of the Phoenicia. So it's, uh, uh, and, uh, and this is, by the way, the first mentioning of, uh, they, they believe that Kabiru is probably Hebrew tribe. Uh, uh, that's the earliest mention uh, of that. I mean, this is not a. Uh, uh, Can I just say, Greg, that it's very, very controversial, and a lot of scholars. It is. It is. It is. It is controversial. I think, the, I think the consensus is that it really is not related to the Hebrews. Yeah, well, I, it, it is controversial. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. At least uh, they say it's possibly. Yeah, I'm not saying it. Yeah, the, well, well, go ahead. Our, the current consensus in academia is that it's not. Okay. Uh, I agree with Paul. It's, it's phonetic similarity, um, but 
uh, it's just not accepted. And the Habiru were not a tribe. They were essentially a social class. They were outcasts, but they were not a right. ethnic group. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it is a controversial, I, I agree. I read about that too. I, uh, okay, so now let's, uh, now talking about the car thing. Okay. Uh, just, uh, uh, Greg, I think the Amarna letters are rather interesting. I guess this is a trove of, I think, around 350 clay tablets or letters found in Amarna, Egypt, with correspondence mm -hmm. to and from uh, Akhenaten and, I guess, his predecessor. Um, and out of the 350, something like 150 are between Akhenaten and sort of semi-vassal states or subordinate right. states in Phoenicia. And the major half of those are from Byblos. Uh, right. And I think, I think the only other 10, half only 10 from Makaya. I was talking about those. Yeah, so they're small, but uh, a, a lot of these letters were to uh, kings of the city-states of Phoenicia um, between Egypt. And I guess, as Dreg said, they were in Akkadian cuneiform because that was the language of diplomacy or, or international communication at the time. Yeah, and the actually, the character, uh, this is the... the character of many of these letters, most of the, those letters were the, the one vassal king trying to complain to the pharaoh about how some other vassal king was operating against the pharaoh, therefore the pharaoh should send him troops you know, so right. it, it was. It all reflected this jockeying between these city states, who were buffer states, between whoever was the power in the north, be it the Hittites or, or yeah, yeah, or yeah. Actually, it's a, it's a rise of Hittites, and and uh, they started to encroaching on this is kind of vassal states to right. the Egypt, and that uh, like a, a hundred the, years the later, vassals, it led to the battle of the vassals Kadesh. are constantly trying to impeach each other, and mm -hmm. say that you know to the, this I am your loyal servant. But this guy next door is your enemy. That's kind of the content. Yeah, they, most of they are very entertaining reading. I mean, I recommend it. Yeah, and, and this is and, the first. This yeah, is the ahead. first international diplomacy. I think I don't don't know where the Chinese are, but certainly in in the West, the first time you had regular communication between states using a common language, and that Latin were, became that language for a thousand years, then French up till English took over recently, but this is the first first place where it happened. Uh, every king had to hire some Babylonian scribes to translate, you know, the nobles didn't know Akkadian, but they had to hire the technical people who did. And uh, it's, that's, it's quite, for one of the challenge, Egypt was the most um, powerful state until the rise of the Hittites, but uh, Egyptian script did not export. Nobody ever outside of Egypt ever bothered to learn it. It was just too Egyptian difficult. Egyptian script was sacred, right? Yeah, it, it, was, it was, it was, and it was always mine. It never lost the aesthetic appeal of, you know, it was always very visual, except the, for- The use of hieratic. Akkadian is, is an international language it goes back. I mean, there's a lot of Akkadian diplomatic yeah. correspondence was found in Mari. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and, and the Marians did not speak Akkadian. That was not their native language, I, uh, but they, their, their diplomatic correspondence was in Akkadian. There were a lot of Akkadian speakers, speakers in Mari. Uh, there, there were was, a lot, but it was not, you know, their, their native language was a Western Semitic language. Uh, yeah, there, there, there were people who have spoken okay. to West. Not, fascinating, fascinating thing linguistically about the amount of letters, to me anyway, is that some of the scribes had a weak command of Akkadian. So they would actually, and it's a major source for early Canaanite, they would actually write in glosses on the tablets in their native Canaanite language right next to the Akkadian word to sort of a, a prompt to help them. But uh, it's, it's kind of a real linguistic mess. Some, some scribes wrote Middle Babylonian, Classical ba ba Babylonian very well. Some did not. Uh, I think uh, we, we, we lost, uh, did we? Did we lose the view? Or is it me? Uh, yeah, we lost the screen share. I think we lost yeah. Ralph. Yeah, yeah we, I don't we lost that. Ralph. Ralph must have dropped his uh, internet connection. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, just, uh, uh, I will continue meanwhile, while he's getting back. So um, uh, as Ralph, by the way, mentioned, 
uh, you know, half of those letters are between uh, uh, with Phoenician states are between Byblos, and Byblos is really uh, is the most important city at that time. I'm talking about the, uh, uh, 1350. Uh, uh, Tyre uh, became more prominent later on, uh, and and Tyre is the um, uh, Tyre is the um, mother city for the Carthage. And here is I'm going to talk about the foundation myth of uh, Carthage. Uh, so, uh, and, and according to uh, that myth, you know, uh, the Carthage was found, I mean, there are two dates, but I, I, I will talk about one first. So what's found is in 814 BCE. The other one, the other date is 825 BCE. Oh, okay, I'm back. Yeah. All right, yeah, okay, let's... Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, if you could sh uh, share the screen uh, because we, we lost it. Um, so oh. uh, yeah, can can you share the screen, uh, Rolf? We, we we don't have. Uh, yeah. Okay. So while um, uh, Rolf is doing that, I will continue. So it was founded by the uh, um, Tyre's princess Elisa, uh, commonly known as Dido. Uh, uh, one of the translations of that uh, nickname is uh, the Wanderer. I mean, there are a few others uh, translations. So she supposedly escaped, you know, after the power struggle with her brother Pygmalion uh, with a fleet of sheep, uh, ships. Uh, so Pygmalion was the king of Tyre from 831 BC to 785 BC, quite a long time. Uh, and he was a son of King Matan I, a Tyrian, a Tyrian king. Uh, so the date for the Pygmalion uh, uh, kingship uh, is derived from uh, uh, Josephus' um, uh, uh, antiquities, uh, Jewish antiquities book, uh, specifically uh, the part called against <laughs> Appian. Uh, and uh, he basically quotes uh, the historian Menander of Ephesus, uh, uh, who lived in the second century BC, BCE. So don't confuse him with the playwright Menander. <laughs> you know, this is a different uh, Ephesus in the Asia Minor, yeah. in Ionia. Uh, so uh, his, uh, uh, his work is mostly lost. Uh, however, uh, parts of it was preserved uh, specifically by Joseph, uh, Josephus. Uh, and uh, one of the most important part that was preserved is the list uh, of kings of Tyre. Uh, and uh, uh, in that list, uh, uh, it mentions uh, uh, Pygmalion, uh, even uh, it also mentions Dido uh, and uh, many other uh, uh, many other kings. So uh, now the other one, uh, uh, there, there are two, basically two years of uh, Carthage foundation uh, that, that are known to us. So 825 BC was given by uh, his uh, Greek uh, Gallo-Roman uh, historian uh, Pompeius Trobus, uh, who lived in the first century BCE. Yeah, leave this one. We're, we're going to talk about this soon. Uh, and uh, the the second one, 814, was given, is known from uh, Greek rhetorician Timaeus, uh, also historian, uh, who lived in the uh, end of the fourth century, beginning and, and the first half of the third century BC. Uh, he was uh, from uh, Taormina uh, in Sicily, but he lived most of his life in Athens. So, uh, archaeological evidence of settlement on the side of Carthage, by the way, uh, relating to the dates of foundation in the, early, in the late uh, 9th century BCE has not been found yet. Okay, so unfortunately it has not, these foundation dates, uh, uh, mythological has not been confirmed through archeology. span I mean, very little left, but still. So uh, now uh, Justin, uh, which is a Roman, uh, uh, historian of the second century AD, uh, uh, he quoting Probus, and, and he tells the story of how Dido escaped from uh, Tyre. So uh, basically, uh, the king, uh, their father, 
um, he left um, uh, he left the kind uh, the uh, Syrian kingdom uh, to both of them, but people acclaimed uh, Pygmalion alone. They didn't like uh, the uh, female ruler. So Dido uh, married her uncle, uh, Acerbas, who was, uh, uh, according to uh, the story, was priest of Melkart and accumulated a lot of weight, uh, wealth. <laughs> so uh, uh, knowing that, uh, Pygmalion had him uh, assassinated in order to gain that wealth. And uh, uh, Dido decided to escape. But first she has to be uh, conducted to the uh, uh, palace of uh, Tyre. Uh, there uh, with the attendants that provided by Pygmalion, she took all the bags with gold uh, uh, that uh, uh, was a Serbus uh, gold and she threw them out into the sea supposedly commemorating like to uh, uh, like in honor of her dead husband. Uh, but actually uh, those bags uh, contained sand and the gold uh, she hidden in, in the ships already. Then she convinced those attendants to uh, flee with her. And uh, there, there are some senators joined her. And then uh, with a number of uh, uh, ships, she sailed to Cyprus. Uh, when she arrived in Cyprus, uh, she convinced uh, 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 some of the uh, citizens of Cyprus to join her. Priest of Jupiter famously joined her. And uh, 80 uh, young women who were prostituting themselves on the shore in order to uh, get married to the travelers, uh, you know, and they also followed them. I mean, this is the myth, right? Uh, so eventually they got to the North Africa and they found this place. Uh, and then Dido asked the Berber king Yarbat for a small piece of land, uh, just a, a, a little bit as, as much as uh, just the ox hide could cover. So he figured ox hide is a very small, so he agreed. Uh, then Dido cut the ox hide in a very fine strip that she encircled the whole heel. And uh, afterwards, that heel was called Birsa heel, uh, uh, that called hide, but there is a controversy about uh, uh, the reason why it's uh, what Birsa means, because apparently, uh, you know, uh, Birsa is a hide in Greek language. Uh, so, but anyway, we'll leave it at that. And uh, now, she uh, settled on that hill and uh, a lot of uh, locals joined her. Also, uh, there was already a Phoenician city, Utica, uh, which is close by. Some of the people joined that settlement from there. And eventually they started to build the city. They built the city. And at this point, Yarbas, who was king of uh, uh, Berber tribe, uh, Mauritani, uh, as you know, there is this country, Mauritania, right now, I guess, must be related. Uh, so he demanded that Dido will become his wife. Uh, uh, and if not, he will destroy the city. So at this point, uh, he wanted to stay uh, loyal to her dead husband. Uh, but she pretended to agree. And she said that she just needs to make a, a large funeral pyre and sacrifice some victims some people to it. Apparently there was a human sacrifice at the time uh, uh, you know, or to the spirit of her dead husband before she could cleanse herself and marry uh, King Yarbas. But uh, uh, during that sacri sacrifice, she went on a pyre and killed herself uh, with a sword and fell into the pyre. Uh, and she killed herself with the words that she wants to uh, join her dead husband. So after this self-sacrifice, Dida was deified and was worshipped uh, as long as Carthage existed as a city. So apparently there were, uh, 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 there were temples of Dido in, in Carthage. So in this account, uh, uh, in, uh, in this particular, it goes uh, to the um, uh, Pompe uh, Pompeius Progress. You know, they say that the foundation of Carthage occurred 72 years before the foundation of Rome, which puts it 
to here 825 BCE because Rome was founded in 753 BCE. So now, as far as the historicity, like this is the myth, you know, this is the story, you know, of the myth, myth of foundation of the uh, Carthage. Uh, and now I want to talk a little bit about some evidence, some historicity of uh, this story. Uh, any questions before I proceed? So according to this, Carthage was the, uh, the largest living empire, so to speak, you know, uh, I would say probably predated Rome, right, as you have mentioned, um, and, you know, could be in line with, um, you know, Harappan Empire and, you know, you know, some Mesopotamian Akkadian dynasty, all that stuff. Um, would you say that? Um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure about Harappan Empire. No, but if they predated Rome by how many years? 300? Se 70, well, 72 years. Uh, I'm talking about the foundation, but uh, uh, both uh, years of foundation, uh, they kind of like uh, it's legendary. I mean, we, there is no um, hard evidence that they were founded uh, exactly at that time. I mean, the settlements were, I mean, it's all, uh, uh, you know, foundation. Are we talking about 825 or 814, uh, you know, that's given by another and, historian. And, and keep in mind, I mean, the Carthage is founded during the middle of this huge wave of Phoenician colonization and expansion throughout the Mediterranean. You can see the yellow, right. the yellow things there where Rome was a little, you know, it was nothing. Rome was a couple of, of dirt huts on the, on the banks of the Tiber and uh, comparing them to uh, Carthage, you know, was just totally incommensurate. Car Carthage was a world power at that time and Rome was nothing. Yeah, but uh, I mean, at the time of foundation, uh, obviously we know that Utica already existed, you know, at the time of like uh, sometimes around 800 uh, 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 when uh, uh, Carthage supposedly was founded, there were already, yeah, Utica was already existing colony. Yeah, and there were Carthaginian, there were, there were Phoenicians all throughout the Mediterranean and the Romans nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Is it known by any chance that what was the uh, DNA makeup of, uh, you know, I guess it's current Tunisia, right? Where the Carthage was, uh, were they intermixed with the indigenous population or was it just the migration for, from the, um, you know, from Middle East to, to the Africa? Yeah, yeah they, 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 they did mix, but, but not overwhelmingly. I mean, because uh, as I will talk later, I mean, there were influx of uh, migrants from uh, uh, Phoenicia, uh, and, and that's the main theory. The, the influx happened uh, uh, around 600, maybe 550, 600. That's the time when, uh, 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 when there, there were um, Assyrian and then uh, Babylonian invasion, and then also uh, uh, Persian. You know, so a lot of immigrants came to uh, uh, to Carthage around uh, maybe 550, 600 in that period, and they swelled the population and they brought, uh, you know, culture there and, and uh, obviously influenced it tremendously. But yes, there was some uh, mixture. I mean, uh, I, I don't know about genetics, but according to the story, there was some mixture with the local population, but it was not overwhelming. They were mostly Phoenicians. All right, let me continue with the uh, uh, historicity. So the, the, so the evidence uh, of, of Dido, right? Uh, uh, and and I, I'm not even talking about the uh, uh, any, you know, because uh, this has uh, very little to do with reality. Uh, so the evidence of Dido uh, can be associated with the evidence of the historicity of other members of your family such as her brother Pygmalion and the grandfather Baal Zer. So uh, for both of these kings are mentioned, uh, as well as Dida in the list of Syrian kings by uh, Menander of Ephesus, uh, and, uh, and also obviously uh, through Josephus um, uh, against Appian. Uh, uh, by the way, just a little thing about Appian, that's very interesting, you know, Josephus wrote uh, uh, the Jewish antiquities uh, after the Jewish war and after the destruction of the temple. So sometimes 
in early 70s AD, uh, you know, and the reason why he wrote against Appian, because Appian was a, uh, a Greek rhetorician lived in, uh, uh, in Alexandria. And as you know, there was a great tension between Jews and, uh, and Greeks in, in that city. And uh, uh, specifically at the time of the Emperor Caligula, uh, so we're talking about like maybe 40 AD, uh, and he wrote, uh, uh, you know, the complaints to Caligula, number of numerous complaints against Jews and how they violate things, uh, and uh, that he should protect Greeks uh, in Alexandria, specifically saying that Jews didn't, don't want to put the uh, Caligula's uh, uh, sculptures in their temple, and it almost uh, uh, came to the to the war. I mean, the, the Jewish war could have happened like 30 years earlier if um, uh, Caligula was, uh, wouldn't be conveniently assassinated, you know. But uh, so this Appian wrote uh, the uh, uh, testaments against Jews, so, and uh, that's why Joseph was felt like 30 years later to write uh, uh, in his antiquities uh, um, against Appian. You know, that's a little <laughs> uh, story with that. So now the other evidence I wanted to talk about and this is very important uh, and very interesting evidence of the historicity of that period is Nora stone. Um, so Ralph, could we go to that stone? Um, you know, and that's very interesting uh, piece of evidence. That's, that's the one. Okay, so Nora stone in Sardinia around 800 BCE. And this is very, very one of the, uh, again, one of the very early Phoenician, uh, uh, you know, uh, a script. And uh, they found it in Sardinia. What happened is on the stone, they're saying that the general who uh, won the battle, who conquered Sardinia for Phoenicians, uh, and who, uh, who uh, wrote this stone, he actually commemorated this stone uh, to that victory, and he writes that he served King Pygmalion. So this is another evidence that King Pygmalion is a historical uh, figure. I mean, that's how we get, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, consequentially, it, it's also uh, kind of supports the story of Dido, making her also uh, historical. Now, uh, by the way, this Nora Stone was interpreted by uh, a professor, uh, Harvard professor, Frank Moore Cross, uh, you know, he, he was a very prominent professor who uh, interpreted the Dead Sea Scrolls, and, uh, and we're talking about uh, the uh, uh, late 20th century, I mean, uh, 1970s probably, and, and he is the one who actually gave that interpretation and made connection uh, to uh, Pygmalion, and, and obviously they also did the, um, the test and, and uh, confirm, uh, confirm that this stone here could be dated around 800. Now, um, so uh, also um, several scholars identify, identified Baal, uh, uh, Baal Manzer, uh, which was a grandfather of uh, Dido and, and uh, Pygmalion. They identified him as King of Tyre uh, who gave tribute to Shalmaneser III in 841 BC, that was a uh, Assyrian king, you know, and uh, this also lends uh, a credibility to the account of uh, Josephus uh, and Menander, uh, uh, and all, all of that historicity issue about Pygmalion and he died of because he was their grandfather. So, um, now, about Carthage, in 650, Carthage planted her first uh, uh, colony uh, in the uh, uh, island of Ibiza, uh, which is the, uh, one of the Balearica Islands. Uh, uh, so, and, and from there on, can we go to that map with the, of the colonies? Yeah, this one. And there on, uh, you could see, uh, you know, all the, uh, all the yellow, uh, it's actually, uh, includes Phoenician colonies, but it also uh, most of them are Car Car Carthaginian uh, uh, colonies, uh, and and the red ones are, are Greek colonies. So you could see, you know, uh, uh, what happened—the kind of division, uh, you know, that uh, Carthaginians 
um, dominate the Western Mediterranean and, and Greek's uh, Eastern um, uh, part. So, um, so ag again, as I said at the time, uh, like in 585, uh, uh, Nabuchodonosor uh, II, I mean, the famous king who uh, destroyed Jerusalem uh, and uh, took Jews to captivity. He also led, uh, uh, started the siege of Tyre in 585. That siege later lasted 13 years. You know, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can imagine. So, and, and that basically led to influx of the population uh, from Phoenicia into um, uh, Carthage. Uh, broad culture, a lot of influence, um, wealth. Uh, up, to, up to that date, uh, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Carthaginians uh, paid tribute to Tyre, to the Temple of Melkart, uh, on a yearly basis. You know, from there on it stopped. Then later on, uh, the Phoenician uh, trade, uh, uh, trade monopoly, again, after the uh, bronze collapse uh, that uh, uh, weakened or destroyed many dominating powers, uh, uh, Phoenicia arose as almost supreme uh, trading uh, power of Mediterranean at that time. Uh, uh, keep, keep in mind, Greece was in, uh, was in dark ages at the time. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, from 1200 to later. Uh, so, uh, but later on, uh, they started to be challenged. And I'm talking about like uh, at the time of uh, uh, maybe uh, 600, 700 BC, uh, they started to be challenged by Etruscans and Greek. Uh, uh, well, and obviously uh, they became dominant Phoenician power because the Phoenicia was uh, no longer uh, uh, functioning cities. Uh, I'm talking about independently functioning. Um, they were uh, now vassal cities uh, to uh, um, uh, Babylonia and then uh, Persia. So now, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the how uh, Carthage was politically um, uh, structured. So initially, it was ruled by uh, two kings. Uh, and uh, they were uh, elected by the Senate, not by people, but by the Senate, and only for specific time period. So election took place in Carthage itself. Uh, the, uh, the kings were war leaders and civic administrators, uh, performed some religious duties. Uh, according to Aristotle, the kings were elected on merit uh, by the Senate. And this post was not hereditary. They were elected. So there is some element of uh, 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 democracy here. And later on, uh, they started to uh, become more and more democratic, as, you, as, as, as you'll see. Uh, so one of, the, uh, one of the things is that it's also, uh, the, uh, they actually become very similar to uh, the Roman consul uh, later on. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there is a theory that maybe uh, uh, Rome kind of um, borrowed this idea about two councils for uh, like a one year period. Uh, they, uh, I mean, I don't know what period the kings were elected. They were for uh, a certain period. I, I don't know how long, but we know that Roman councils were elected for one year. Uh, so, um, it is known that in the period between 550 and 310 BC, you know, uh, the uh, kingship was dominated by two families. Uh, first, there was a Magonid family that produced several members uh, were elected uh, uh, between 550 BC and 370. And, uh, and then later on, uh, Hanno Magnus uh, and his son and grandson uh, held the kingship for some years between 367 and 310. So they, that's, that's how it was uh, structured. Okay, I think uh, uh, now if you want to see some of them, uh, by the way, the Sicily, you see the Eastern Sicily is mostly uh, uh, Carthaginian uh, and the Western is Greek. Uh, I think uh, Palermo is also originally was a Carthaginian colony. So I, I, I know 
uh, Rolf, uh, Adla uh, yeah, please take over because I know you're going to talk a little more about the conflict with uh, Greeks and uh, uh, and uh, also whatever you want to add that I have missed, you know. And the, before you go, any questions? No, we're good. Okay. We're <laughs> okay. Right. Um, this is just the overview. Uh, I guess we've been over most of this. There was a power sharing treaty with Rome in 509 BC as Rome was developing into a competitive power before that Carthage had been dominant and Rome, as we noted, was a, sort of a small emerging uh, power. Um, can, I, it can I add one thing? 509, yes. by the way, this is the end of the Roman uh, Rex period, uh, period of King. 509 is exactly when uh, the Tarquinius sprout was uh, taken out and, and the Republic was established. And that, that apparently uh, coincided with that treaty. Okay, interesting. So at that point, the Rome decided, okay, let's, uh, let's have a treaty, let's get along. Well, it's sort of a division of uh, also, spheres, also, spheres of influence. The, the, the context of this treaty had to do with the waters immediately around Western Italy. So, in other words, the, here are the Carthaginians who are active throughout the entire Mediterranean. They're not really, it's not just, they're not dealing on an equal basis with the Romans. The Romans are worried about a very local issue. Carthaginians were raiding the, the uh, you know, the coastal cities. So they worked out an arrangement, but it wasn't like a generalized, you know, we're equals or anything like that. I mean, the Carthaginians, you know, had a vast reach the Romans didn't. Okay, that's interesting. But I suppose this is one of the earliest international treaties between sort of nominally independent, sort of nominally equal partners. I, I wonder what if there were were there international treaties of this sort before? In sure, any case. sure. There was, you know, treaties. The the Hittites. Uh, yeah, and and the, uh, and the Egyptians. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, After the Battle of Kadesh. That, that's the most right, important. right, and the, the treaty between the, the Hittites and the Mitanni. Uh, so, and, and even going all the way back to the, to the, the boundary stone in, in uh, Sumeria in, uh, in the 2000s BC, in the oh, okay, dynastic good. period. Okay, thanks. Uh, then, following this period, there was a, a long series of battles, wars uh, in Sicily. Uh, between the Greeks who controlled uh, the one side of the island and the Carthaginians who controlled the other. But the Sicily, of course, is strategically located at the narrowest point in the Mediterranean. So there were a whole series of battles and wars from about 489 to 340, and I guess even continuing uh, uh, beyond that. And then ultimately, uh, Carthage was defeated in the Third Punic War, a series of wars between Rome and Carthage, and Carthage was totally was beaten and completely destroyed 149 BC. So that was the end of Car so Carthage came to a dismal end eventually. Um, I, I thought this was a very striking picture. This is a reconstruction, of course, but this is the picture of the uh, port of Carthage in its heyday. Uh, this is the commercial port where the trading uh, ships docked, had their piers and loaded and unloaded. And this was the naval facility uh, inside, uh, in, inside the commercial port, so highly protected. And these are all boat sheds, boat sheds, sort of central workshops. Um, there was a bit of a... a a high area in the middle which could oversee the whole thing. But these are all boat sheds where the warships could be uh, kept inside and worked on. Uh, and then, then they could go out through the commercial harbor into the open sea there. But this was a, this was a huge naval, naval base, a permanent naval base in Carthage. Can I add a little bit to it? Yeah. I mean, the, the boats obviously, when they dock, they dock uh, uh, regularly. But um, uh, I've been to Carthage, and by the way, this port still exists there because it was refurbished by Romans. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, no, it doesn't exist as a port, but the, the, the area, this round thing with an island in the middle is still there. I mean, there is, there is no structures around, but uh, this whole thing 
is uh, amazingly still there nowadays. Uh, uh, you know, I was, uh, when I was there, maybe 15 years ago, and, uh, uh, you know, this uh, whole thing, uh, so it, it is really, uh, so Romans loved it and they used it, uh, refurbished and used it uh, as well later on because as uh, Carthage became a prominent uh, Roman city. Okay, yeah. there are a couple of, couple of pictures of uh, the, the sailing, uh, cargo sailing ships, and then one of the ships, uh, I guess you can't tell whether it's a bireme, maybe a trireme, I suppose, uh, in the uh, being rowed in the naval base. <clears throat> um, just I, one of the interesting battle was the Battle of Alalia. Um, and so this was part of the fight. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, what's the date on it? Uh, 540, 540 BC. Um, so this is while Rome was, emer but Rome was still a pretty small power. But here you have the Carthaginians, Carthaginian area in green got the Etruscan area in yellow uh, and the Greeks dominating most of Sicily and most of Italy. And Alalia is up here in Corsica. Um, so the, the Greeks were attempting to establish some authority in this area and the Carthaginians allied with the Etruscans decide to uh, attack them. The, uh, a lot, the Corsica was controlled by the Phocaeans, uh, which was a colony of Phocus in, um, in Asia Minor. It was a Greek Ionian colony in Asia Minor, but they had established a colony. So it was Phocaean Greeks uh, in Corsica. Uh, and so the Carthaginians and Etruscans attacked uh, the, the Greek Phocaeans here. Uh, it was a pitched battle, very destructive. Uh, apparently the uh, Greek, uh, the Greek Phocaeans repulsed the attack, but they uh, ended up losing two thirds of their fleet in the process and ultimately had to withdraw and abandoned Corsica, which was then taken over by the Etruscans. So this is one of the major battles. And I say, by, or in this period, in the 400s, this was when the Greeks and the Carthaginians in particular uh, were really getting into conflict over control of the Mediterranean. And this is one of the key battles. Um, just as uh, another sort of continuation of the naval arms race. Um, this was a, uh, <clears throat> this is a um, Punic Carthaginian uh, super trireme. Now the triremes normally had um, three, three banks of oars with three rowers, uh, one rower on each oar. So three, uh, tri three levels. Um, but if you'll see that cutout just above the ship, this was called a, 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 hept, a hepterime. And they had all, and they, they got even bigger than this. Um, so this had three, if you'll see in the cutout, there were three rowers on the top board. They still had three banks of oars. Uh, there's been some confusion about that, whether a quadrireme had four banks of oars, but I think the consensus now is there were never more than three banks of oars, but a quadrireme would have four rowers, a quinquireme five, this was a seven. So there were three rowers on the top oar, two on the second bank and two on the third bank, so seven, three banks of oars, but seven rowers in each bank. Um, now, you didn't actually gain, you lost speed and maneuverability by increasing this size, or maybe you wouldn't lose much speed, but you'd certainly lose in maneuverability. So these were not used as the mainline fighting ships. Uh, as though this, this was a flagship um, around 240 BC. So this is, 
this was the commanding, the commander of the fleet would have his uh, throne oh, and his um, a canopied throne at the bottom. Uh, the oars, the helmsman on the steering oar would be uh, in front of him. But they, they just sort of built these huge ships, probably as much for status and prestige as being useful fighting ships. But as I say, they did give a prominence to the commander of the fleet. Um, and they got even bigger than this, where there were sevens, nines, thirteens. I think there was one that was 20, 20 rowers um, per bank. Uh, so eight, maybe eight, uh, eight, eight and four, or something of this sort. Um, and this was probably just purely for status. Who could, who could build the biggest ship? Uh, anyhow, that's part of the shipping. So let's see, going on. Okay, religion. <clears throat> So for the Phoenicians, and most of this was, I guess, common to Canaanites, and perhaps even broader than that. Again, other people may know more about it than I do. But El, for the Phoenicians, and I think for the Canaanites in general, El was the supreme god. Baal was the weather or storm god. Astarte, or Ash Astoreth, Ashtoreth, Asherah, was the queen goddess, the consort of Baal. Ishtar. What's that? Another name is Ishtar. Ishtar. Ishtar, yes. And so that was common. To, some, some of these were common to the area. Eshman, the god of healing, was apparently fairly specific to the Phoenicians, was a local god in Phoenicia. Now, El, of course, became, uh, uh, was adopted by the Israelites. Um, in the northern, the northern kingdom, God tended to be known as El, or Eloi, or Elohim. Uh, in the south, Yahweh was the southernmost god, was well, the southern uh, southern god of the Israelites. Um, and Yahweh was not Phoenician, so Yahweh was specifically Canaanite, southern Canaanite, and Israelite. El was Phoenician and northern Israelite. Um, now El and so El and Yahweh were eventually combined to form the monotheistic uh, Jewish God. Uh, just a quote from Judges, one of the early history books of the Bible. They abandoned the Lord and worshipped Baal and the Astartes. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So some of the Israelites were faithful only to El or Yahweh. Whereas the, the history books of the Bible from Judges uh, to Samuel to Kings to Chronicles are a constant story of uh, Israelites turning to the worship of Baal and then being punished by God and returning uh, to, the worship, to the soul worship of El. But Baal, particularly in the Northern Kingdom, Baal remains a sort of competitive god, a competitive religion through much of the uh, period up until the, uh, I think pretty much up until the uh, Babylonian captivity, the exile. Um, and after that, they came back with a much more strong mo united monotheism. Well, we, should, we should point out that um, Baal um, really never stopped being worshipped in, in the Levant. Even after the, um, con the conquest of Alexander, Baal was renamed as Zeus, but his, his, uh, his uh, iconography was still the iconography of Baal. And uh, the uh, incidents that are, um, re that are described in the book of the Maccabees include the establishment of they say Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem, but it's actually Baal that was, it was in other words, it was, it was Baal under the name of Zeus who was established as, as uh, you know, as a punishment to the, the rebellion of the, of the Jews in the, the 160s BC. Okay, thanks. So the, yeah, the Phoenician Canaanite religion was really in a way the basis for, uh, for for Judaism and for for Greek polytheism, it, this was this was essential, and it didn't just die out. Um, 
And in fact, of course, in the Bible, we've, I think we've talked about this before, the uh, current archaeological historical consensus is that the story of the Exodus was in fact a myth that was became a founding right. myth. But the uh, Judaism emerged, evolved within uh, the land of Canaan, or the land of, of Israel, and emerged out of Baalism, emerged out of the uh, Canaanite Phoenician religion, and then gradually evolved into uh, the Judea, uh, Jew, uh, Jewish monotheism as we know it today. And throughout the Old Testament, you see this conflict between the polytheism and the and Baal, and not just that the Israelites are constantly fighting against the old Baalists, but a lot of the Israelites are Baalists, and right. some of, there's a fair bit of worship of both. Um, Ralph, yes. are, are, and, is there any link between the Sumerians of the New Testament to the Phoenicians? Are you thinking I mean, of the are Samaritan? They... Are you thinking of the Samaritans? Yes, yes, the Samaritans. Were they in any way descendants of the original Phoenicians? Uh, well, I, could I defer? I'd be happy to defer to Paul. Or I think uh, the Samaritans were actually the people that were imported by the Assyrians. And yeah. at the time that the okay. Assyrians Definitely. deported the Israelites from the Northern Kingdom, they brought the Samaritans in to replace them. And uh, the Samaritans, I mean, basically in the ancient world, the idea was gods were localized. And when you went to a place, you worshiped the local god. So the Samaritans came in and started worshiping Yahweh. Uh, and, but they were never accepted by the, by the Judeans and they were hated by the Judeans. And when the Judeans uh, returned as Jews from Babylonian exile, the Samaritans were to them the lowest of the low. Right. So Some of them are, were who, imported from uh, uh, Syria uh, from uh, 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 during the Assyrian times because they were importing from one place uh, to another city. From that city, they would take uh, people and and then migrate them uh, further down on the way back uh, into and and eventually a, a big a chunk of population of Samaritans were imported from Syrian city. Okay. So who are the modern day claimants? claimants to the Phoenician heritage. Are there any? Is Lebanon. it Lebanese? Lebanon, of course. Uh, Lebanon, okay. Yeah. Which is, I guess, in spite of their, you know, of, of their Muslim identity. Well, some, some of them are still, uh, you know, Christian or they, they still go back to- Sure, 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 yeah. So well, the, the Phoenicians never developed, uh, they were commercial people, they didn't, they, the Jews had their Bible, the Greeks had plays, poetry, all sorts of stuff. The Phoenicians, it may have been because of the destruction of Carthage, the Romans did a thorough job, is that none of their literature has survived. So there wasn't anything that people could, could focus on. I, I don't think there's anybody in Le Lebanon who thinks they're Phoenician, as there are Assyrian Christians in Iraq and who claim descent from the Assyrians. I, I, it's a funny kind of culture. It was, they were responsible for, for, they didn't exactly invent writing, but they produced the first uh, successful, extensively used system that, that was adopted by everybody outside of Asia. But as far as, you know, they had no ideology that other, other people would copy. I mean, the Jews and the Greeks, you know, had strong cultures, the, the Romans had adopted a lot from the Greeks, but the Phoenicians, you know, aside from the alphabet, there's nothing. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, somebody could correct me, but that I've never heard of a, a Phoenician uh, literature. It's one, of, it's one of history's great ironies that the yeah. Phoenicians have no literature, but all the literature in the world, in the Western world, is devised using the Phoenician alphabet. Yeah, well, but, were, yeah you're right. But, but I think some of them, some of the people, I, I apologize, uh, some of the people, I think, educated people would like to claim the, the descent. So you have to learn about sure. literature. You know, like some Palestinians, for instance, claim descent of Canaan, uh, which is also <laughs> has some uh, oh, validity. You know, Sorry about that, John. Go ahead. Uh, oh no, no, I, I was just blathering on there. Yeah. 
Well, just, just a, a, a sort of a side comment on that. Of course, in the New Testament, you've got this story of the Good Samaritan. Right. And of course, this is precisely a reference to them among the Jews. These are being the lowest of the low. But Jesus says, well, actually, the Jew, somebody was in trouble and a number of Jews passed by. And then a Samaritan stopped and helped the person in trouble. Right. So this was a good Samaritan. In fact, this Samaritan was better than the Jews. Right. And this which, is, of course, was rather ironic in Jewish life. But this was the point of Christ. A good person didn't have to be a Jew. Right. And that was that was that was one of Jesus's basic message was that, you know, he who is lowest will be highest. He who is highest will be lowest. And this, here was the Samaritan held up as, a, as an example, even though they were the despised people of, of Israel. Yeah, another I thing. want to make one comment yeah, that while I was researching the, the presentation that I gave on the Greek Dark Age, I discovered to my surprise that there's a, a trend in scholarship now that is challenging a lot of the, the uh, early Greek history and uh, ascribing it and it's the role of the Phoenicians in the development of Greek culture is poorly understood and is minimized by Greek scholars. It has something to do with the silos of language competence of classical scholars who do Greek versus the, uh, um, scho the scholars that do Semitic languages. But there are, um, you know, there was, I was surprised to see a large number of papers uh, of, of um, of people who were basically attacking scholars who were talking about the origins of the uh, Eubean uh, uh, um, uh, Greek uh, uh, colonization and, and basically trying to say that the Greeks were really junior partners of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians had a much bigger role than they're given credit for. I, I actually wanted to add a comment about Samaritans because uh, when the Jews uh, uh, came back from Babylonian uh, captivity uh, with the help of uh, Persians, uh, they and, and this was the elite uh, of, of uh, Jews, uh, they found a lot of uh, even uh, Jews that stayed, they found that uh, their Judaism is kind of diluted and they started to worship other gods and everything. And they actually used the word Samaritan uh, relating to uh, that, uh, uh, that portion of the population of Jews as well. Um, so it was, uh, you know, all kinds of like uh, 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 ways uh, of calling people Samaritans as those who are, uh, are not uh, worshiping, uh, 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 not practicing Judaism, proper Judaism. Hey guys, uh, quick question. Uh, do you guys want to, we have alphabet still, we have quite a bit of um, presentation, which probably have another, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. Would you guys want to move this to um, another day and then I guess focus and have a better discussion or you want to continue? Uh, just up to you guys. I'm fine with continuing. I don't know if that was, that was I, I'm fine with continuing, but um, you know, my, my preference is always to postpone and get another presentation rather than try to cram it. Yes. All in. I mean, if we're going to go a half hour, 45 minutes over, that's OK. But if we're just trying to, tr to to squeeze in another, you know, 45 an hour of presentation without even counting on discussion, my own personal preference is to postpone it and give it the time that it deserves. Ralph, what Agree. You Ralph, what Agree. Agree. I'm, I'm, I'm easy either way. All right, so we have about we have about an hour of presentation because you know considering the discussion coming in. So what we're going to do is then next Wednesday we have Plutarch, but what we can do is probably I can move you know a uh, 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 Karabakh conflict and then we can do the language on you know a Wednesday from. Uh, you know, uh, next week's Wednesday. So it's it's going to be, in, you know, in a, like a week and a half. Uh, we can just do language for like an hour on Wednesday. So it's mm -hmm. easy. People come in and we can discuss it, you know, and I want to have a good discussion. And it seems to be a good topic that everybody, you know, is interested in. And maybe we can sprinkle in a little bit of uh, religious topic, you know, the origins of 
Phoenicians and you know the migration of you know Canaanians and whatnot. We already discussed a little bit of it, but it seems like it's a good topic to discuss. Uh, and I have a little small presentation to you know to add to it. Um, so, what do you guys think? Agree. Ralph, what about okay. you? Are no you problem. available on Wednesday next? Uh, I mean, it's not well, next Wednesday. It's a Wednesday after the next. Yeah, Wednesday next, the following Wednesday. That what is it? We're the twenty eighth. Yes. Uh, Yes. Wednesday the 28th. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay. Okay. Yep. Suits me. No problem. Yeah. And so I just wanted to discuss um, uh, our, you know, following topics. Like I said, this Wednesday we have Plutarch. So please read. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Paul also mentioned there is a recording on YouTube. You can read Plutarch Pericles, um, you know, preferably text, but if you can, you know, listen to it too as well. So we have a discussion on Wednesday with 19 people logging in. So it's going to be really good. And, you know, uh, and uh, Greg is leading the discussion. So um, that's that. And then next Sunday at four o'clock, we have uh, Kosovo and, uh, uh, and Battle of Kosovo between, you know, Ottomans and, uh, and Serbian, uh, you know, empire, so to speak. Um, and that, so we will... Uh, We'll reconvene on Wednesday at seven o'clock. Everybody have a nice weekend. Yeah, and, too. Uh, all right, and um, uh, that's it. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, uh, you. you know, Greg. Amazing presentation, and then we'll, you know, yet to be continued. Okay, Appreciate thanks it. all. Great discussion. Thanks for everybody's contributions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Really, really well prepared. Really great. Thank you.